Hi everyone, welcome to the Starlight Company. My name is Jacob, and this is the DM planning session for episode 30 of Fragments, which is the D&D 5e campaign that I run. Uh, this DM planning session is going to be a little different. Uh, we actually played this session last night. Usually, I like to record these before we play the sessions, but due to the nature of this episode being towards the end of the arc and all of that happening there was too much up in the air with all the little mini arcs going on within it that i could not justify recording the entire planning session because i didn't want to have to edit for hours so excuse me this is uh going to be pretty open-ended i uh had a lot that i wanted to do going into this session uh the last session episode 29 was big and pivotal the party was at the council of or the summit of ilir and got the keys to find the isle of mist so going into this episode i knew that the party would want to pursue the fragment of glimmer wants to pursue the isle of mists and they told me they wanted to look for rustin a little bit so because he didn't show up at the explosion so Going into that, I had a few options. So I I went through my usual thing of having a to-do list and going through checking off all those boxes. And then I also, uh, I made, you can't really see it actually. Uh, I made several different like sub categories for uh, like sub pages for each of the big things that was going to happen. So bottom line, I knew I wanted to start off with Kristan having them hand out necklaces as tokens of thanks. Um, you know, Gristan means well, even though the council meeting got a little heavy handed, he still wants to thank everyone for coming and participating because that's something that they haven't gotten to do yet. And that was a big, big, big moment. Um, and then back of the Kraken's grasp, I knew that I wanted to have Sea of Stars, who is the Nightwalker Scion, uh, come back from the dead to come back for Elegy, which was the gun of Sea of Stars, former lover in life, um, Reverend the Sky. So yeah, awesome. That was a really cool moment. I kind of planned that out and there was going to be a big rooftop chase. So uh, going into all the Scion stuff, I wanted to have a really good stat block for the Nightwalker Scion for Sea of Stars. Uh, both to show that he has changed and is not exactly in control of himself anymore and also to let on that someone is still giving him these powers uh, and also i wanted a physical change so i decided to have his arms be replaced with skeletal arms his ear be blown off a large scar just that since about a month has passed since sea of stars death i wanted to show that he has not like uh, it's not been slow. So, yeah. Uh, let's actually see when Sea of Stars died. It was the 8th of New Year. So, at the start of the session, it was this day, the 6th. So, it was about a month since Sea of Stars died. And now it is uh, the 2nd of Pale Bean. So, uh, a lot of time has passed. It's been about 5 months in the camp since the campaign started in-game. Uh, which is pretty big. So, yeah, Sea of Stars has changed, and that's... I, I wanted to build out the Nightwalker Scion as part of that. So, the Undead Legion, uh, I knew that... I basically took Sea of Stars' sheet, duplicated it, and then added a bunch of stuff and added Elegy to that. So, Elegy was, yeah, the gun of uh, River in the Sky. I think that's her name, River in the Clouds? I think it's River in the Clouds, actually. I always get it mixed up. Uh, so he has a lot of his Bloodhunter stuff, but I knew that he wasn't going to use that. I didn't want to give it away too quickly that it was Sea of Stars. Uh, and just as the flow of the battle happened, he uh, became more desperate and was using more things. Um, he had legendary actions, which are called Nightwalker actions. Uh, that has to do with him joining the Undead Legion. The title of uh, Nightwalker was bestowed upon him. There's a big whole shtick that I'll get into eventually. I don't want to exactly spoil it. Uh, and then I wanted him to have a wraith. Uh, a few months ago, I got really into Shadow of War again. Uh, Lord of the Rings Shadow of War. Uh, great game, and I love those games. Shadow of Mortar, Shadow of War. Fantastic games. So, Sea of Stars was loosely based on Talion 
and uh, Keller Brembor from those games. Uh, if you've played them, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Really cool Wraith abilities, sneaky stuff. Um, so, and that way I could get around the action economy a little bit because this party has a tendency to dominate the action economy. And in a fast paced combat, they have a lot of movement too, and movement abilities, you know, with Honk and Serico especially. So I wanted to kind of get around that, manipulate the uh, initiative a little bit to just give the Nightwalker Scion a bit of a leg up. This was just meant as an introduction to the Scion and to the Undead Legion for the rest of the group because Sea of Stars knew that the Legion was out there even if he didn't know what the name was. The, uh, the King of the Undead Legion has been speaking in his head since he awoke in a ditch months ago. Uh, and so for the rest of the group, you know, Sea of Stars was pretty reserved about this, so this was my introduction for them into what's going on. Uh, and then later I had a thought, so I knew that the Scion would come after Elegy and take the Bag of Holding, because I talked to Terra and Terra said that she would have left the Bag of Holding, uh, Zuskel would have left the Bag of Holding in her room in the Kraken's Grasp Inn. So I wanted the Scion to take the Bag of Holding so there would be some conflict. I wanted it to have just happened. Right, so there was some kind of supernatural awareness of where Elegy was, even though it's technically in another plane. Um, sea of Stars, his body at least would remember that you know Elegy was in that bag of holding, or would know that it's in that bag of holding, and would also know where Dirge was with Celine. But we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, so I built out the Nightwalker Scion to manipulate that highest. Uh, and not necessarily to have it be a harrowing combat for either side, but for there to be stakes, I think. And especially on the reveal that it was Sea of Stars, uh, that really hit, especially Ronan, you know, Honk, that was very impactful, which was awesome. Uh, I think Austin, Austin had a feeling, I'd been talking to him about Sea of Stars a little bit, so I think he had a feeling something like that was going to come up. But... I still think I pulled off a good reveal, so I'm pretty happy with that. And it, the implications of him taking Elegy are, I think, were unexpected for Austin and for the whole group. And it, you know, there's a lot that could happen from that. So that was that. I built out all of these stats. I gave, uh, I gave the Nightwalker Scion a bunch of legendary actions, um, you know, using action-oriented monsters from MCDM. Uh, Austin <laughs> talks about action-oriented monsters a lot, and I have known about it. I watched that video a lot. If you if you haven't checked it out, look up uh, action-oriented monsters by Matt Koval. That was a fantastic video. Talks about how to have a single enemy combat and still have it be impactful and uh, you know difficult, and not just get totally stomped by a five-person uh, party. So yeah, I, I won't go into all of the moves. If you want to check them out, check out the uh, check out episode 30 fragments, which will be up on our channel uh, tomorrow if you're watching this right at the release. So uh, I made that. I also knew that there would potentially so the bell, the sacred bell, the uh, the hint for the Isle of Mists was I rise at the tolling of the sacred bell. That was what the uh, the key was. The Sacred Bell is in the tomb of Relian Doveris, which they actually already went to. The Drowned Tomb was his tomb. Uh, it was in Barisol Break, if any of you all remember that. Uh, it was over here in Barisol Break. They went down. That was when they talked to the Crustworths, to the Sea Hags, and uh, they went to the Drowned Tomb. And they saw a sarcophagus with uh, a bell on it, and Kaldrath said something about the name Doveris. So a long, long, long time ago, I made Urien be a Doveris, and essentially he is a descendant of Relian Doveris, who sank his own tomb to protect the Isle of Mists, to which he had the only key. And then from that, taking that key to the Seabred Altar, which the group realized throughout the uh, throughout the session, which I actually improvised. I wasn't planning on having that be at the Seabred Altar, but. Or I didn't even know what the Seabird Altar looked like in my head. It was just a one-off that was it's it's located down here I think it's on the Valenia map um, It was one of the ways that um, Kit could be cured of her Abolith's curse, so they would take a chalice of Valkyr to the Seabird Altar 
and drink from it and then she would be cured it's basically a healing ritual but uh, I also, yeah, I, I improvised that, hey, it would be cool if it had some kind of, if, if this altar was some sort of resonant chamber where they could take this bell and that's where they had to go to then summon the Isle of Mists. So they tried a lot when they got there, didn't really work out for them. Uh, and then they later found out that they needed the bell. So all of that said, um... Let's see, so that was, like I said, that was improvised, but I planned out some stuff to get the bell. I planned out potential um, conflict within the Drowned Tomb if they would return. This time, they don't have Spruce Leaf. Spruce Leaf gave them water breathing last time, and now they don't have that boon, so they have to find another way to get down there safely. But once they get that, they will be able to go back to the sea red altar and make the isle of mists rise and then they'll be able to go to shalasar so uh that will be an interesting next session but uh and i still can't show you a lot of what i've planned because i made storyboards more or less for the different things uh for the glimmer fragment i can't show you this though uh I knew that they wanted to go after the Glimmer Fragment potentially because it was in Avilakar, which is the island to the southwest, and I knew that Hyrenax the Indomitable had it, so he is the blue dragon of the Fencian Isles, lives in a uh, the tallest mountain of the Avila Peaks, storms all over. Uh, they had a connection to the Order of the Blue Dragon, they met Softpaws on Snow and Nigel Grimhollow a while back, and they said if you want to join or whatever talk to us come to Velia Devine, which is a city on uh on a villa car right here and then they would take the party to Hyrenax essentially uh, I made I made the uh the contact in the Order of the Blue Dragon uh Selwyn de Throche. He is the commander of outreach and acquisitions, a drow man. Uh, and then I planned out the Blue Dragon's Lair. Thunderstorms are always raging in the Avila Peaks, especially close to the Blue Dragon's Lair. I kind of bastardized what a traditional Blue Dragon is. Traditionally, Blue Dragons in D&D, they exist in a desert area. But for a while, I've wanted him to be in the mountains. And uh, I, the justification for that came out in this session which was actually improvised as well that he was displaced from his desert home in madeir which is the continent to the south of the fencian isles uh by the demont family getting a lot of lore in this uh the implanting session so he went there and there are still storms all over so there are a couple entrances there's one through the underdark and then one on the landing in the middle of a stormy halo of clouds and then i planned out higher the indomitable a little uh, I wrote some themes in for him that he's vain and deadly, uh, overlords and minions, he is in charge of those below him, and hoarders of gems. Uh, those are just typical for blue dragons, I just took that from d, &D Beyond. Uh, and yeah, it lives on a cave, and I had it on the Emrys summit, but that was actually false. Uh, and then yeah values knowledge uh, and has his order to do jobs for books and things that was written a long long time ago and Yeah, so the Ember summit was where the chalice of Valkyr was I ended up changing that up a little bit I didn't want them to get distracted in this session So I wanted them to meet the blue dragon because this would be a potential for finding out that Urien was a uh, descendant of Relian Doveris so that he would know potentially how to get to the Isle of Mists or where the bell was and get some of the character moment, the history of the arc going. And uh, I wanted, uh, there would be a trade basically. So Hyrenax was essentially given one of the fragments of Glimmer of Alexi Leah the Tempestuous, who was Jazzleraz's way back when, Jazzleraz's uh, patron deity. A fragment of her soul, which is a this one is a weapon. It's Jaragatha the Fang. Uh, he, Hyrenax was given this fragment of Glimmer's soul by Olgithrax the Radiant to basically watch over. And it's important that they went to Hyrenax first. Maybe not important, but it's big that they did because it me. This was the easiest fragment to get. There's 
there was potential for combat, but only if they really went for it. Hyrun Axe is not super combative, and as such, as long as they offered him something, it was going to work out okay, basically. And it did. It, it ended up going okay. And they actually got two things. They learned about the bell, and they learned about or they got the Fragment of Glimmer Soul. I wanted there to be a trade too. They, uh, Hyrenax asked for a soul or something, some piece of knowledge or an item that is truly unique so he could learn from it. They did not, bes uh, they did not make that trade. They said that they would come back with it. Um, there were a few options to get Duragatha. They, if they went with Selwyn in Velia Duveen, they could have stayed in uh, the peak with uh, all of the Order of the Blue Dragon for a day or a night and relax a bit. They could have tried to steal it, which could have happened with Seriko's tattoo, Ghost, Ghost Walk tattoo or something like that. Um, they could have traded, like they did basically, or they could have tried to fight. This would have been a weird combat, pretty tough. I nerfed the dragon a little bit just to move it down to about their challenge level. Still would have been a tough fight, though. Uh, they could have gotten Dragatha, though. And they did. So, uh, I gave them all... I wrote down XP. They, they've they been at level 9 for a while. I wanted to really push them towards level 10, towards the end of this arc. So, I wrote down XP for all these different things. And they ended up getting 10,000 at the end of the session. So, it was big. Um, yeah, so that was that. They did that at the very end of the session. Uh, I also planned some more stuff that, uh, some more stat blocks that I can't show you. Uh, however, I can show you, let's see, NPCs, let's go to organizations, Order of the Blue Dragon, uh, Hyrun Axe, yeah, I nerfed his health a little bit, uh, I didn't really nerf his damage too much, it was really just going to be a get him down low enough so that he's weakened and then they can do their stuff. Um, I had to port over Nigel and Softpaws on Snow stat blocks, which I didn't flesh them out too much. And then I worked on Selwyn, Dithrosh, uh, gave him some spells. He's a he's a druid. So that was that. I worked on those uh, maps. I you saw Hyrenax's chamber. Uh, thank you, Peku. Uh, you're amazing. I love your maps. Um, uh, this is Hyrenax's landing where he lands all the time. Oh, is that scale still there? Uh, and that's how they entered Hyrun Axe's chamber. And then for the fight with the Scion, I had planned three rooftop maps. Uh, <laughs> Foundry ended up not working for me. So that was unfortunate. Uh, but, oh well, we did it Theater of the Mind and it turned out really well. Uh, and then I ported over the Drowned Tomb for when they go back. But there are some changes, so I don't want to show that on the video for now so that's about what we've done um oh also plant so plant versus improvised i knew that i wanted something to happen with celine and it all was determined by when they got back to bister brock they did send a message to celine that yo sea of stars is coming for dirge his gun uh beware and i think it got to her but with how celine is she would not have left um she would have prepared but ultimately she wouldn't have been prepared enough for how much sea of stars has changed so she ended up dying and uh presumably sea of stars now has elegy and dirge so that was really sad i didn't like having to kill Celine, but ultimately you know thinking about the realism of what would have happened she would have put up a fight and sea of stars would not have allowed her to keep uh, his gun, especially uh, as influenced as he was by the King of the Undead Legion. So there was that, and I knew that Joey would also be very impacted by this because Sea of Stars was the one who made the deal with him to buy the Wayward Soul. So there was some innate trust between them, or at least an understanding that he would be safe and that they were friends. And to see Sea of Stars come in and kill his new boss, as well as the new bartender that she had just hired, um, really scarred him. So I wanted there to be conflict with the party uh, when they returned to the Wayward Soul. 
you know, uh, crying and stuff. That was that was fun. I, I liked having that emotional moment because this party is fairly apathetic a lot of the time with NPCs, but I wanted there to be a real human connection with a character. I like draw I like having that in that element in uh, every so often, especially with characters that matter. And now that they have formed this connection, you know, for a while they haven't had any big connections to NPCs because they've been in this foreign country with nobody they knew. But now with Joey, they really like Joey, especially Honk slash Ronan. And I wanted that to be an emotional moment, regardless of if Celine was killed. So yeah, uh, that's mostly what I planned. I planned some stuff that you guys can't see yet. Uh, planned stuff for when they get the bell, when they get to the Isle of Mists, when they get to Shalasar, what happens afterwards, reunion with Nadri potentially. Um, I planned more stuff with Sea of Stars if they end up going after him, uh, going after, uh, you know, trying to save him if they can. Um, I've planned a lot, but that's probably all that I can show you without spoiling a lot. Uh, oh, I, I can't show you Dragatha. Uh, I, I won't show you the Glimmer fragments that they don't have yet. So with the, the fragments of Glimmer, I had this idea for a really, 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 really long time. I mean, almost two years now since I knew that well, since I first figured out that Alexia Leah would be in fragments, would need to have her fragments uh, restored. Um, and uh, which also the fragments, the titular fragments of this campaign don't only refer to Glimmer's fragments. There's more of a meaning to that as well. It's uh, there are a few meanings to it. So the mystery is not all solved, but I knew that I wanted to craft end game items for all of the characters as you know rewards for sticking with the campaign to really show them you know like end game items to give them power to make them feel good and justified and all that stuff and i have been working on fragments for jazzaraz for a really long time i knew that i wanted a spear some sort of trinket some armor and something else that's a secret and maybe some other stuff. So I finally got to writing the stat block for Dragatha the Fang. Uh, it is, I wrote some text about what it looks like. Uh, it, you are immune to fear. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. So Dragatha is a plus three quarter staff that can also be used as a spear. So spear or quarter staff. I wanted that to be there as an opportunity for anyone to use it, really. Uh, and Jazzaraz would have used it as a spear. So anyway, there's that. Uh, or you can use it as a holy symbol if attuned by a cleric or paladin or an arcane focus. Uh, it can deal bludgeoning, piercing, or slashing damage depending on how you wield it. So uh, with every attack, you get to decide. So I, I like that as well. Gives you some malleability with your attacks. And then it has two charges of, of Thunder Step that recharge each day. Uh, I, I like that. I like giving a couple charges of a spell for a big magic item like this, especially for someone like Honk, who I think is going to keep it. That gives him more mobility, which is annoying, but it also just broadens what he's allowed to do, broadens his spectrums. Uh, you know, early in the campaign, I gave him, I gave them magical items with spells that he just kind of took because he wanted to do magic. And now. I think the nuance is gone from that. Now it is him crafting who he is. Now he is finally in a place where he's growing and, you know, like he has actual purpose. You know, he knows where Nadri is. He is doing something to save Glimmer. And with that comes his maturing because ultimately Honk is the youngest member of the party. He does have kind of a case of arrested development. He was raised by individuals who do not hold dear some morals that other people do. So yeah, it's it's rough for him. And this is part of his maturing process. Uh, and then if attuned by a cleric or paladin of Alaxi Leah, Drag uh, Dragatha also gains the following properties. Uh, it can be used as a holy symbol for spell casting. Uh, that was already above. Um, I just put that in as well. Uh, the wielder is immune to the frightened condition 
which I think is huge that uh, and Austin reiterated on that. That's what a dragon shield is supposed to be. And that's what Jazza Raz talked about a lot. So this would have been a great item for him. And ultimately, you know, in game items, I wanted to craft for characters for not only how they are played, but how they act and how they've grown and to help them mature and grow. And Dragatha would have been great for Jazzaraz at this point. Um, so I want to hold on to that to show that this would have been great with someone who died. And there's a sadness in that. And also it changes how Honk especially views the world, which is cool. Uh, and then it gives you a couple more spells that can be used uh, once per day or using spell slots, Lightning Bolt and Stone Skin. Uh, so again, giving you more opportunities and uh, whether or not Honk is going to multi-class, I don't know. Um, but I just think that's cool. So that's what I planned for this session. Ultimately, it was a lot of planning. There's a lot that went into the session that you won't see until the next session too. But I had a lot of fun planning and a lot of fun playing this session. And now that a lot of my visions for uh, the Fancy and Isles arc are, you know, coming to fruition, uh, it's awesome. You know, we've been in the Fencian Isles since chapter 14, so more than half the campaign has been in the Fencian Isles, and I'm excited to see where it goes uh, afterwards. So thank you all for watching. This, again, was a kind of a different DM planning session, a little shorter form. Um, and yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. Please feel free to subscribe to our channel so you can keep up with our other videos and follow our Twitch, which is linked in the description below. Thank you all for watching. Have a wonderful Telltale Day. Bye.